I tell you what, your, your prayers has already been answered to one extent now, to one extent. Uh, but by the way, take your Bible and turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Uh, Sharon and I were coming through uh, Rocky Mountain this morning, and you, know, you can't go by Bojangles without stopping to get a biscuit. So we stopped and got a biscuit. And we needed some gas, and so we went over to Lowe's. Uh, we went, went, went over to Sam's, but it won't open. And then we went over to, to, the, to the gas station right there at Lowe's and filled it up with gas and come back out on the highway and turned to the left, started to turn to the left, and a car ran the, ran the stoplight, and uh, he was running at least 50, I would think. And I just saw him just in time, and I slammed on brakes. And so God, listen, God, I believe God answered prayer, brother. I mean, now look, we're looking for souls to be saved. We're looking for people to be revived. But I believe that's the answer to prayer. And so I thank God for it. Thank you for allowing me to come. Once again, that choir, wasn't that beautiful? I mean, y'all just don't know what you got. Plenty of churches would have a fit over a choir like that now. So I hope and pray you get excited about it. And uh, thank God for it. Thank God for the, for the uh, facilities that you have here. Lord have mercy. It's just wonderful to have this. Uh, here again, churches would have a fit to have all the facilities that you have. And we just thank God for it. Glad to have each one of you. Take your Bible, as we said. I'm, I'm going to do something different this morning. Look, look at chapter 2. I want you to stand, if you will. Let's honor the reading of God's inspired, infallible, and errant word now. That's a lot, of, a lot in those words. I want you to look at them, look them up, and see what the Lord says about that. But infallible, inspired, and, and a holy word of God. Look at what the Bible says in verse, verse 23 of chapter 2. Verse 23. And when he, talking about Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any man should testify a man, for he knew what was in man. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I do thank you for the opportunity of being here today. And I thank you for each one here, Lord. I thank you for being the sovereign God of the universe. You knew before the foundation of the world that I was going to be at Macon Baptist Church this morning. God, I didn't know it. Brother Bobby didn't know it years ago. But God, just because I knew him and he knew me and you led him and led this church, I thank you for that. And Lord, it's not by happen chance that, it, that we're here today. All of us are here by the divine appointment. And I want us to focus on, Lord, you know us. God, you know us. You know what was in man, and you know man. Thank you for that. Thank you for Edward being here today. Thank you for sparing his life and letting him come and being a part of this service today. All the men and women that are, that are uh, defending our country around the world, I thank you for them. And I ask you to put your head of protection around them. But Lord, today also, I ask you, if it be one person, or two, or ten, or whatever it might be here, that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray today that they will come to know you in a real and a mighty way. And then I pray for us that do know you, Lord, that we would get on fire for you. Lord, I believe time is short. I believe this world is winding down. We don't have much more time left. And we need to do whatever we're going to do for you. Help us, to, help us, Lord, to do what we need to do to be right with you today. And we'll love you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. And you may be seated. The Bible says, it, it blew my mind when I read that, that Jesus, that many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew what was in man. Can you imagine that? You would think that Jesus said, now, if you believe in my name, I'll do, I'll, I'll just, that's all, all you got to do, just believe in my name. But then he goes on in chapter 3 and tells us about a man. He said, I'm going to point out a man to you to let you know that I know what's in man. And his name is Nicodemus. And I'm going to point out a man that's a good man. That's a good man. Many people would be tickled to death to have Nicodemus in their church. Look what the Bible says. There was a man named Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night. By, the Bible said, by the way, he was a Pharisee. Now, a Pharisee in that day was a religious person. Man, this Pharisee dotted every I and crossed every T. Man, he, he believed in the inspiration of the Old Testament. He believed in miracles. 
He believed in the sovereignty of God. He believed in everything you could think of. He believed in that. But the Bible says he was a Pharisee, and he came to Jesus. Look here. He was a ruler of the Jews. The Bible says, in that day and time, the Sanhedrin, which was 70 people, 70 men, they ruled the nation of Israel, and he was one of them. Man, you're talking about the upper crust of society. He was one. You couldn't look at him and, 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 and point a finger at him and say that he had done anything wrong. He, as far as man was concerned, he was above, he was in the top, top notch as far as a man was concerned. But see, he went to Jesus. And the Bible says he went by night. Some people believe that uh, he went by night because he was ashamed to go in the daytime. I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe he went during the nighttime so he would have more time to discuss the things that he wanted to discuss with Jesus. And the Bible says, the same came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that the art of man come from God. He believed in God. He believed Jesus came from God. Listen to this. He believed in miracles because he said, no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Man, he, it was as though he was expecting Jesus to say, oh, Nicodemus, you're a good old boy. You can enter in the kingdom of heaven. You're all right. But Jesus blew his mind. Jesus blew his mind because Jesus said, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He's got to be born again. Now, I want to talk to you just real good about this today now because at age 12, I was adopted. I was adopted. At age 12, my mother and father told me, he said, Billy said, uh, it's time for you. I don't know why in the world 12 is the magic age, but 12, you need to get right with the Lord. You need to accept the Lord as your Savior, and you need to be born again. Well, they said something to me about it one or two times, and so to get them off my back, I came down the aisle at 12 years old at Pender's Chapel Baptist Church in Torville, outside of Torville, North Carolina, and shook the preacher's hand and sat down on the pew, and that was it. There was no change took place in my life, none at all, none at all, none at all. And so the Bible says that I needed to be born again, and I thought that just accepting, just going down and joining the church was all you needed to do. I was baptized in Noble's Mill Pond, if you know where that is. Over in By the way, I just got wet because baptism as a symbol says that I have died to myself and raised again a new creature in Christ, and that had not happened in my case, in my case. It was, it was eight years later, it was eight years later when I was listening to Billy Graham on TV. You know how he used to come on and he had a, had a, a great big congregation, a great big stadium of people, you know. And my mama said, uh, Billy Graham's coming on TV tonight, and he's going to talk on the home. Well, I, 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 man, Sharon and I just got married. We got married in December 63, and this was in April 64. And I said, man, I want my marriage to work. Man, I, I, and I know everybody goes into marriage. I hope they do want their marriage to work, but I knew something had to take place. And so Billy Graham said that night, he said, if you want to be the husband that God intended you to be, you've got to, be, you've got to have a right relationship with God. You've got to have that vertical relationship. He said, if you don't have that vertical relationship with God, your horizontal relationship will never be right. And he said, more importantly than that, if you don't get right with God, if you don't have that vertical relationship, he said, you're going to die and go to hell. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd heard hell for our preaching all my life. I, I was, my mom and daddy got saved, and they joined the church in uh, the, the uh, Pentecost Chapel Baptist Church. Oliver Green, if you are here and know, know anything about Gospel preaching at all. Oliver Green was the first one ever had a revival there. Two weeks. Two-week revival. They had those windows that rolled out. You rolled them out. They had two rolled out like that. The church was full, and the people were standing on the outside of the church for all those times. I remember him giving an invitation, and uh, he was saying that people need to be saved, and I was thinking to myself, I know who he's talking about. They, they're lost. And I would point them out. I'd point them out all over the church, and it was me. It was me. That night when Billy Graham gave that invitation, he said, you've got to be born again. You've got to have that vertical relationship. I said, Lord, it's me. I don't know about all those people in that stadium. I knew it was me that needed to change. 
Need it, need to get right with God. I remember getting right down on my, we had, we had a, one of those captives that you, that you pick up, you pick the seat up like that, and it clicks, and you lay it down, and the thing falls out into a bed. That's what we were sleeping on in my mom and daddy's living room. I remember getting right down on this end of the couch and asking the Lord to forgive me of my sins, asking him to come into my heart and save my soul. And he did it. He did it. I would like to tell you today that, that uh, since then I have always done everything God wanted me to do, but I'd be lying to you. But I know one thing. Since then, he's always done everything he said he would do. Always done everything he said he would do. So, listen, when I ask people now, most of the time, most of the time, I ask people, I say, tell me about when you got saved. You know what they tell me, Brother Bobby? They tell me when they got baptized. Baptism is good now because that's being obedient to the Lord. We need to do that. But the thing about it is making sure that we're born into God's family. Jesus said, Nicodemus, before you even see the kingdom of heaven, before you even enter the kingdom of God, you've got to be born again. So, baptism is not what it's talking about. Church membership is not what it's talking about. Joining the church is not. I could stand up here the rest of the evening, rest of the evening, and tell you illustration after illustration after illustration of people that were church members that were lost. I remember one night when I was pastoring Battleboro Baptist Church, me and the deacon were out visiting. We were knocking on doors. We went to this man's house, knocked on the door, and his, him and his wife were so gracious and let us come in, and, and we began to talk with them in just a few minutes. I uh, said, you got on salvation. And I remember going through the Romans Road, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love towards us in that while we yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 6, 23b, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. I remember going through that vividly with that man. And he said, he said this, Brother Bobby, when I got through. I said, is it any reason why right now you couldn't receive Christ as your Savior? He said, first of all, I've been in church all my life. And I have never heard that. Never heard it. I asked him, I said, is there any reason why you couldn't receive Christ as your Savior? He said, well, not right now. I'm not ready. I'm not ready right now. We left, and a couple months later, I don't know exactly how many, it might have been three months later, we came back, me and that same deacon came back. We were visiting one night, knocked on the door, and, and he had, a, had, a, had a stitches over his ear here. And he had gone to the doctor during that time, and the doctor said, you've got a tumor on the brain. And they operated on him. And honest to goodness, I don't know where the man even recognized me or not. And I, I feel so sorry about that. Within a year's time, I preached his funeral. And I, I hope and pray today that that man's in heaven. But I'm telling you today, you must be born again. And when do you do it? Today is the day of salvation. Today is today. So, being born again is not church membership. Being born again is not baptism. Being born again is not being a deacon of the church. Listen to me real good now. I mean, this is just, just, I could tell you time and time and time, but I'm going to tell you two. I'm going to tell you two different occasions. We were in a deacon meeting one night in uh, a church down close to, close to Charlotte, not too far from Charlotte, and uh, had probably six, eight deacons, and I don't remember how many we had, but anyway, we were talking, and the youth minister was there, and he was talking about when he got saved, and he began to share, and it was two deacons there, Chip and Joey. And they said, listen, that's never happened to us. And so that, that chairman, I mean, that uh, youth minister led those two men to pray to receive Christ that night. And they were at a deacon meeting. Something more important than that, well, not, not no more important, another illustration in that same church. There was a man there, his name was Richard. He's still there. He's still there to this day. Richard was as fine a man as you want to meet. He, he, he uh, anything he could do, he, he drove a long-distance truck. He was gone from, like, Sunday afternoon to, to Thursday, late, maybe th uh, early Friday morning. 
And uh, he, he, anything in the church he could do. He taught Sunday school. He was a deacon. He, he, anything he could do in the church, he had the reputation of doing anything anybody needed to be a blessing to him. We had a uh, revival meeting at a church in Wadesboro. And so myself and his wife and some more from the church went over there. And Bailey Smith preached. I don't know if you've ever heard of him or not, but he was, the chair, he was the president of the Southern Baptist Convention one time. Bailey Smith preached. And he preached on a subject called the wheat and the tares. And, and really the basic of the, of the message is there's a tare and there's a wheat. And the only difference, you look at them, you can't tell any difference. But when you break it open, the tare is empty. The wheat has substance in it. And so what he was saying was a lot of people look like a Christian. But when you break it open, on the inside, they're lost. They don't know Christ. They never met Christ as a Savior. Well, he had some cassette tapes that he had made. He preached somewhere else. And so he, uh, Richard's wife, the name is Dee, bought one of those tapes and carried it home and laid it on the, on the cabinet there. And this was Thursday night now. Richard hadn't got home yet. So Friday morning, Richard got home and saw that tape and began to listen to it. Around noontime, he called me. I will never forget it. I was in there making a sandwich. I, uh, Richard, Richard called and said, Billy, Billy I don't, don't talk to you. Well, I knew he, he hadn't been home long, and I knew he had a lot of things to do. And so I said, uh, just let me eat my sandwich. I'll be right over there. Well, I went, it wasn't even a mile from the house. Went over there, and he was, when I got there, he was in the garage there. And he had his truck jacked up. And I assume he was changing oil or something other in the truck. I don't know. And I made this statement when I went in. I said, Richard, I know you don't have much time. You're not home long. I said, uh, you go ahead and talk to me, and I'm going to stand right here and listen to you. And he turned around and looked at me, and the bottom of his lip, bottom of his jaw was tr trembling, quivering, quivering. And he said, no, I want us to sit down. And I sat right down there with him, and he told me, he said, I have listened to that tape three times, three times this morning. And honest to goodness, Brother Billy, I can't remember ever, ever asking Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins and come into my life and change my life. I can't remember. I had my Bible in my pocket. I sat right down there in that same Roman road, went through that Roman road just like I would with a child. And Richard got on his knees in his garage and prayed to receive Christ as a Savior. I said, Richard, uh, there's probably some more folks in the church that need to do that same thing. I said, Sunday morning when I get up to preach now, I want you to get up and will you give your testimony about what God's done for you right now? He said, I'd be glad to. That Sunday morning I got up to preach and I said, Richard has something to say. And so Richard came down to the front, got up on the pulpit and gave his testimony about how he got saved this past Friday. This past Friday. Listen to me real good now. Uh, so after that, I tried to preach. I been, I'd have been better off to sit up, sit down, and, and, and let the Lord do the work. But listen, when I get, got ready to give the invitation, I gave the invitation and asked the people. I said, listen, some of you might be like Richard and don't know for sure that you're saved. Have never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life. I said, I want you to raise your hand. There were ten people that raised their hand. You know where the first one was? The Sunday school director. The Sunday school, the first one, raised his hand. We would give, we give the invitation. Many of them come. Many of them come to rededicate their life. Many of them come to get saved. Many of them come to for assurance of salvation. At the end of the service, before the service was over, Richard's wife, Dee, came down the aisle. And she said, Brother Billy, I want to say something to the church. And I said, what do you want to say? I mean, I mean, a, a Baptist preacher, you're scared to let anybody say anything. You know, I said, what do you want to say? And she said, uh, she said, I want to tell these people that Richard is mistaken. I've been living with him X number of years. I've got 40-some years at that time probably. And I know that man knows the Lord. I said, D, only Richard knows his heart. You better let well enough alone. You better not say nothing about, to the church about that. What she was saying in essence was, this man, I have lived with him. Listen, a few weeks before that, he and I had gone over to a church that was, that was about to close down. We were over there helping them 
do painting and all the different things in the, in the church. Anything he could do on the weekend like that, he did it. He did it. You couldn't, have, you couldn't find anybody in the church that could find fault with Richard. But Richard got saved that day. He got saved that day. And I'm telling you today, listen, when Jesus told Nicodemus, as good a man as he was, you must be born again. Nicodemus, you've got a lot of things going for you, but that won't get you into salvation. That won't get you salvation. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Listen to me. I know that many of you, all of you, are, are born again. You, you're born because I can see the first time. The natural man. But in order for you and I or anyone else to get into the kingdom of God, we've got to be born again. Not only, listen to me real good, not only is it not baptism, not only is it not church membership, not only is it not being a deacon, it's not being a pastor. In other words, just because I'm a pastor does not mean I'm born again. I was in the Bailey Smith Conference down in, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, I, I know that the thing started on, on uh, Wednesday night. I wasn't able to go to that. I went to it on Thursday morning. In that conference, they had people come give testimonies. There was one man that came up, Brother Bobby, and said, and told his name. I don't remember his name now. He said, I was raised in a Christian home. I went to a Christian school. I went to college and got my degree. As, uh, and God called me. I thought he called me into the ministry. I've been preaching. I've been pastoring for three years. He said, I got saved last night in this conference. Got saved. I'm telling you today, listen. If you were the devil, listen to me real good now. If you were the devil and you wanted to deceive people, and you wanted to send as many people as you could to hell, why not the church? The church is the best place. Man, all you've got to do is come into the church. I had a, had a woman one time tell me, uh, I want her pastor, I was in the church at that time, and she said, I said, how did you get, you and your husband get started in this church? You know what they said? They said, we were coming by here one Sunday, and we just felt like it was a good place to come. And so we came. We came and joined the church, and they were real active in the church for a long time, and then something happened, and they got out, you know. What happened? What happened? I'm telling you today, Jesus said he knows man. Now, I could just go into detail and tell you all this stuff, too. You don't know how much Jesus knows about you. You turn in your Bibles, and we're not going to do it, but you look at it when you get home. Psalm 139. The Bible says every time you've ever sat down and every time you've ever got up, God knows it. I think about it. My wife just had uh, total knee replacement. And you don't realize how many times you sit down and get up that somebody has to help you every time you sit down and get up. You don't realize. But I'm telling you, man, when you're in pain like that, and God knows every one of them. The Bible says every hair on our head is numbered. Every time our heart beat, God knows about it. Let me tell you something else. By the way, God knows. Look in that uh, uh, Psalms 139, verse 16. And it says in that verse 16 that God has numbered our days. Now think about that. God numbers our days. We, you and I keep up with the years. But God knows the day. He said, and you knew it before there was yet one of them. He said, before even one of my days came about, Lord, you knew how many days I was going to live. And by the way, the Bible says, it's appointed unto man once to die. And then the judgment. We're going to die. We're going to leave this world one day. So what we need to do is we're going to stand before God. And what we need to do is make sure that we hear him say, well done, that good and faithful servant. So I've told you a lot of things about what being born again is not. What is it? What is being born again? Well, the Bible says that being born again means that you and I, Believe him. Look at verse 15. I'm not going to read all those. Verse 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Believing in him. You can go back, and I'm not going to do this, but you can go back when you get home. I don't know what time it is. When you get home, listen to me. In Numbers chapter 21, the Bible says, listen to this real good now. You, look, you go home and read it. Make sure. The Bible says that the children of Israel had murmured against God and they murmured against Moses. 
And God sent, sent serpents to bite them. Scorpions to bite them. Scorpions, it was, it was serpents to bite them. And so the Bible says the people repented. And they came to Moses and said, Moses, we've, we've sinned against God and we've sinned against you. I want you to pray to God for us. And what did the Bible say? The Bible says that God says, okay, I want you to take a serpent and put him on a pole, a brazen serpent, put him on a pole and lift him up. And ever who's bitten, all he's got to do is look and he'll live. He'll look and he'll live. By the way, that came from God. Now, man didn't develop that. Moses didn't say, well, I think I'll go out there and put a serpent on a pole and I think it'd be good enough. No, God did it. Why? He said, believe in him. Believe in Jesus Christ. What are you saying? When you believe, you say, Brother Billy, what does it mean when I, when I put my faith and trust in him? It means that I put my all in what he's done in my behalf. He died on the cross for my sins. He had no sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. He, he paid for my sin debt. My sin. Listen, if I had never sinned but one time in this world, then hell would be my home. One sin. The wages of sin. It doesn't say plural. It says singular sin. The wages of sin is death. The Bible says. And so what I need to do is I've got to get rid of that sin. And how can I do that? I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, what he did in my behalf. The Bible says he went to the Calvary's cross and he died on the cross and he gave his life in my stead, for my, in my behalf. What does the Bible say? Look over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Listen to this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You say, Brother Billy, how can I know for sure that I'm born again? How can I know for sure that heaven is my home? How can I know for sure when I lay my head on my pillow and I breathe my last breath, how can I know for sure that I'm going to go to be with the Lord? I'll tell you how you know. You have God's nature in you, a new nature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Has that ever happened in your life? When I was 12 years old, that didn't happen in my life. It was almost, I was almost 21 years old before that ever happened. You say, well, I don't know for sure whether I'm a Christian or not. Well, let me ask you something. The Bible says that when you are born again, Jesus Christ comes to live in you. Listen to me real good now. He comes to live in you. Do you think that somebody could be living in my house besides Sharon and I and I not know it? I heard uh, Dr. Crow from Inglewood say make the same thing. How in the world, for instance... <laughs> We've got two sons, and uh, uh, one of them's a missionary, and one of them is, uh, is lives in Raleigh. Well, yeah, lives in Raleigh, and uh, he's not married, and uh, he is a mess. He's a mess, and he makes a mess. I mean, uh, he, uh, he came one time, and uh, he had some wisdom teeth cut out, and I waited on him uh, for two or three days. And I mean, I waited on him. I mean, every cup, every glass. Everything he touched, it was left right where he left it. You know, everything. Do you think that that messy young, his young man there, do you think he could come and live in my house and I not know it? No, he couldn't do it. No, he'd leave signs. He'd leave signs. It's the same way. It's the same way. When Jesus Christ is in your heart and in your life, <coughs> old things are passed away. There's a new nature. God in plants, and parts, his nature in you and I. Give you a quick example. You take a, a hog. Most of us know what hogs are. You can take a hog and you get him out of the mud and you clean him up and put a ribbon on him, put smelly stuff on him, and you turn that rascal loose. And where is he going? He's going right back to the mire. Why? You hadn't changed his nature. You changed the outside, but not the inside. A lot of Christians, a lot, a lot of people that call themselves Christians, a lot of church members have got the, old, got, got the outside changed, but the inside is not changed. Now, let, let me talk to you real good now. Listen, I'm, I'm going to close up. I'm going to close. I, I promise. You say, Brother Billy, if I were to come down the aisle this morning, or if I were to make, make a decision to accept Christ as my Savior, 
I've been a member of this church for a long time. What would people say? What in the world would people say? Here I am, uh, maybe a Sunday school teacher, maybe a, a leader in the church. What in the world would people say? i tell you what they'd say. They'd say, glory, hallelujah. Man, glory, hallelujah. I, don't, you, don't you go to hell from behind a pew now. I mean, you go to hell from down yonder somewhere other than the drug addict or wherever that might be. But don't use a pew as a result and a choice that you make not to receive Christ as you say. It's every head bowed and every eye closed. You must be born again. You must be born again. The pianist is going to come. We're gonna, how about if we do it like this, Brother Bobby? We're not going to, we're not going to sing. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have, we'll have a word of prayer. Then I want you to stand and just bow your head. Nobody looking around. Just, just bow your head right now. Go ahead and bow your head. Listen to me real good. I wonder today. I wonder today. Is anybody here say, Brother Billy, I don't know, but you rung my bell. I don't know. Jesus Christ spoke to me through you today. Nobody's looking around except Brother Bobby and my, myself. I wonder, would you say today, Brother Billy, I don't know about my salvation. I, I think I'm saved. I, I've been acting like I'm saved. But I don't have that desire. I don't have that new nature that I ought to have. I ask God to forgive me of my sins. Ask him to come into my life and change my life right now. If you're here today and you say, Brother Billy, pray for me about my salvation. Now, don't come to me. Don't embarrass me. Don't call my name. Just pray for me. Listen, those people have prayed for you already in that 24-hour prayer vigil. You say, they didn't know I was lost, but I guarantee you they prayed for people to be saved, and you're one of them. Would you lift your hand this morning and say, Brother Billy, pray for me. Here again, don't make a big deal out of it. I'm not going to embarrass you. Wouldn't do anything in the world. I just want to know about my salvation. I want to know about my salvation. Anybody else? I see those hands. I see those hands. God bless you. I see them all over the building. I want to know that if I laid my head on my pillow tonight that I'd go to heaven. I want to know. How about it, Christian? You, you, you didn't raise your hand. That's okay. You can put them down. You didn't raise your hand because you know you're saved. But what about your walk with the Lord? Is there unforgiveness in your heart? Is there resentment in your heart? Is there other things in your heart that you're just holding against someone else or against God? And you say, Brother Billy, before we can have revival, I want to be right. I want the Spirit of God to use me, to flow through me, to touch people's lives. And I can't do that. I've got to get this out. Anybody in the building that's a Christian, you say, Brother Billy, I need to get right with God. I see that hand. I see that hand. God bless you. I, need you. I, I see that hand. God bless you. I need to get right. I need to get right. I see those hands all over the building. God bless you. God bless you. Lord, I thank you for people that are honest. Lord, we're going to give this invitation in just a moment. You know, you know what needs to take place. And we're going to ask the pianist if she'd play. And we're going to ask Brother Bobby if he'd stand at the front. And we're going to ask people just to stand and bow their heads. And they need to make a decision for Christ to accept him as their Savior. I pray, Lord, they'll come. They need to accept to make a decision to ask God, God, forgive me of living my life my way. Lord, I'm your, I'm your child. I know I am. But, Lord, I want to be born. I want to make sure that I'm right with you. I want to get this thing out of my life, whatever it is, that's holding me back from serving you. Lord, I pray today that you'll do whatever needs to be done. I know you will. I know you want to, more so than we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to keep your head bowed. Just stand to your feet, if you would. The pianist is playing. And you just do whatever needs to be done. Brother Bob is here. I'm here. If I can take the Bible, he can take the Bible and show you what needs to be done for you to be saved. I'm not talking about what the Baptists say you need to do. I'm talking about what the Word of God says you need to do. Won't you come? Yes, she, she plays, okay? Just come. Just come. Maybe you want to come to the altar and say, Lord, I, I'm, I'm praying for someone else. I know you put someone on my heart, my life. I just need to pray for them. Won't you come? Whatever you need to do this morning, won't you come? The piano's playing. The organ's playing. Let's do business with the Lord. Why wait? Why wait? Listen, just as that car was in feet of us today, was in feet, man, we need to be right with the Lord. I guarantee you we do. Many are coming. Many are praying. Won't you come? Won't you do whatever you need to do? Maybe you need to talk to Brother Bobby about salvation.
about repenting of your sins.